we were a lot younger when Marisol and I bought our first home. It was a small three-bedroom condo in North Oakville that needed a lot of love and even more work, but we thought it was perfect for us for starting out. And one of the biggest stresses after we bought it was, hey, now we had to find a mortgage. And I remember we went downtown Oakville the day after buying it and just just walked the streets and, and went into various bank branches, talking to their advisors to get a quote and details about mortgage products. And, and the plan in our heads, which we thought was brilliant, was we would save our like everyday bank branch for last because we kind of assumed it would be the bank that, bank that would give us the best rate and we used it for everything else, so we would probably end up using it for a mortgage. But, but we wanted to go in with some research and having done our homework. And by the time we walked into our branch, it was a little bit later in the day, but certainly well within business hours. And we walked to the teller and explained that we didn't have an appointment, but we had just bought a home and we'd like to talk to someone about a mortgage. And the teller was lovely, really polite, but explained that most of the advisors had left for the day, but she would take a look and see who was still in. And she came back two minutes later and asked me a question that I really wasn't expecting. Mr. Brisbane, may I ask, is your bank card red or is your bank card black? And it threw me for a loop. I wasn't even really sure what color my bank card was. I opened my wallet and sure enough, it, it was red. Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Brisbane, she proceeded. There is no one here available to help you with a mortgage at this time, but you can set up an appointment. And my sweet wife, if you know Marisol, you know she is just a way better human being than I ever will be. But she said, you know, that's okay. Thank you so much. And she grabbed my arm and like, come on, Trevor, let's, let's go. But I wasn't quite ready to leave yet because I had a question. You know, so looking at the teller, I asked, um, by chance, if, if I had said my bank card was black, then would there be someone here to speak with us? And, and you could like feel the awkwardness of the moment. Yes, Mr. Brisbane, she responded. If you had a black bank card, we do have an advisor available. But with your assets, you have a red bank card. Now, Friends, clearly I'm not a high roller, and apparently at this bank, the big money carries black bank cards. I only had a red one. But I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, really? I've banked with you since I was eight years old. And you do have an advisor there, and like, this is just such an easy win. And so I'm trying to give them another chance, you know, like, like oh, well, all these other ba banks have given us a quote, and, and, you know, just a quick consult would be so helpful but she wouldn't budge. They wouldn't even talk to me because my bank card was red, not black. Categories. Pigeonholes. Buckets. You fit here, you belong there, you get access, and you, you go to the back of the line. This is the way our world works. This is how society functions. What color is your bank card? Some people get access or privilege, and some people don't. It could be because of race, or color, or accent, or birthright, or gender, or weight, or physical ability, or appearance, or sexual identity, wealth, last name, or color of your bank card. It's just the way it is. But maybe it's not the way it's supposed to be. So we're deep into this series that we're calling Radical HVUC. Radical comes from the Latin word meaning root. And, and, and it's like, what are the root, the grounding, the foundational ways we are to live into the divine destiny for us at Humber Valley to be the body of of Christ? Like, how do we embody the correct estimate and opinion of who Christ is for the world? Do you remember what we've talked about so far? Like Matthew 18, when we make space to be present with kids, we're making space for Christ to be present with us. Also Matthew 18, Jesus says where two or three church folks are gathered, you can like guarantee that there's going to be conflict. 
But that's not always bad because when handled with compassion and courage, Jesus says, you know, when it comes to courageous conversations, I'm in that. Talked about how the church fulfills its destiny when it cares for the poor, the sick, the stranger. Jesus says, what we do for the least of these, we are doing for Christ. And then last week, we talked about the subversive message of God that is about proclaiming an alternative to the systems of harm and dehumanization that haunt our world. And now this morning, we continue on this theme of how we embody a radical alternative as Christians. What are the the practices, the essentials for us as a church, the embodiment of Christ. And this morning, we come to baptism. Now, baptism as we know it today, or think about it today, really took its form in the 4th and 5th centuries. In the year 323 AD, the Roman emperor, a guy named Constantine, important to know that name, that'll come up, you know, regularly, as long as I'm teaching, a guy named Constantine declared everyone in the Roman Empire. Remember the Roman Empire stretched from India to England? He declared, Constantine declared all Roman subjects Christian. Now, we know that's not really how it works, right? It turns out you can't just declare other people are Christians any more than I can declare that the Toronto Maple Leafs are the best hockey team. Like, what? happened there. But but that's what that's what Constantine did. He he declared the entire Roman Empire Christian. Now Christianity went from being the religion that was despised and its followers fed to the lions to being the official state sanctioned religion all within the lifetime of Constantine. And in my opinion, nothing has inflicted more damage to the cause of Christ than when Jesus became the brand of the state declared by Constantine. So so when he declared everyone in the Roman Empire is now Christian, in theory, there's now no such thing as a non-Christian, right? There's no such thing as a convert to Christianity because if you lived in the empire, the emperor said, declared, decreed that you were Christian from birth. So in the 4th and 5th centuries, Christian baptism morphed from being this radical, subversive move that was a display of like a rich alternative way of Christ, and instead it became a sort of symbolic, civic, even administrative gesture that was just like a, a birthright. And even to this day, I think much of what baptism represents has more to do with Constantine's anemic vision for Christianity than the radical foundational way of faith, hope, and love as seen in the person of Christ. Which takes us back to bank cards. You know, the the categories and pigeonholes and buckets we use to label and compartmentalize each other. Who gets privilege and who doesn't? It's just the way the world works. But see, three centuries before Constantine, the very first followers of Jesus literally gave their lives to live out an alternative way in the world. They they refused to accept that the way the world is, is the way the world has to be. So you'll, you'll hear the Apostle Paul say things like, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, and the new is here. For Paul and the first Christians, Jesus didn't just come to speak a nice spiritual uplifting message to the world. Uh Uh-uh. Now, Christ came with, with a new creation where the old is gone and the new is present. New creation, Paul calls it. It's a a metaphor. It's Paul's language to demonstrate that what following Jesus looks like is an alternative that refuses to accept what the world is, is what the world has to be. There's a different way to relate in this world. There's a new creation. So Paul, 
Paul spends his life writing letter after letter to churches around the ancient world, describing how they can live out a Christ-like alternative within the world, a new creation that's now. How they can embody this way of Christ. And one of the ways is baptism. Paul makes this point, I think, more, most clearly in Galatians chapter 3, when he writes this. So in Christ Jesus, you were all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, so this, this is a conversation about baptism. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Paul says there is neither Jew nor Gentile, slave nor free, male or female, for all who are baptized into Christ. Paul takes like three distinct categories here and says baptism is about reimagining our categories. He talks about Jew or Gentile, which is, that's a religious category, isn't it? We know that the temple in Jerusalem, which was the, the center of Israel's spiritual life, was divided into three concentric courts or sections. There was the outer court, or the Gentile court, it was often called. There was the, the woman's court, or the middle court, and then the, the inner court for Jewish men. The outer court was as close as any Gentile or non-Jewish person could go in the temple. Gentiles had to stay on the peripheral, on the margin. You, you didn't have as much temple privilege as a Jewish woman or a Jewish man if you're a Gentile. So, so Jew-Gentile is a category defining religious privilege. And then he talks about slave or free. This is a political category. A slave had way less privilege or rights in Rome than a Roman citizen would have. The body politic or the way society was structured gave free people all kinds of advantages and removed every kind of advantage from slaves. And then he, and then he goes on and he talks about male or female. This is a biological category. Men had privileges simply because of their presenting gender. Men had access and advantage that women didn't. Like, like a man could divorce his wife, but a wife could never divorce her husband. Privilege for no other reason than gender. This is it. And Paul says, there is neither Jew or Gentile slave nor free or male or female. For he offers this radical idea where he says, no, 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 we're all one in Christ Jesus. So, so the radical turn for Paul around baptism is that all these, these categories, all these marks and labels of privilege go away in the water of baptism. For when someone is baptized into Christ, it's the laying down of the world's way of categorizing, pigeonholing, placing people into arbitrary buckets. It's, it's a rejection of the dominant way of being in the world and living an alternative mutuality and oneness in Christ. It's like, Oh, you're part of this group, this class, this race. You've achieved this much in the company. Well, you get better treatment than those in, in that tribe or with that career or those who hold junior positions in the company. Oh, you're that gender? Oh, no, no, we, we don't have to pay you the same as we would a man. And baptism, according to Paul, is this public performance of opting out of a life which privileges one group, one person, over and above another. It's, it's declaring before the world that the people I meet cannot be reduced to their ascribed category of privilege or lack thereof. Because now I'm part of this new creation, this new way where we're all one, we're all equal, we all belong. In Christ. 
you see how baptism for Paul isn't just like a nice liturgical church thing, but a radical critique of, of tribalism, of, of social, religious, political hierarchies? It's a living alternative to the pigeonholes and buckets we place each other in. So I think, I think it's fair if, if one wanted to creatively read Genesis 3 like this. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male or female. There is neither gay nor straight, black or white, captain of the football team or member of the chess club. There is neither clergy nor laity, Canadian or American, Muslim or Christian, conservative or liberal, for all are one. In Christ Jesus. It's this total reimagination of social, political, religious categories. People are, are never reduced to the label we give them or the category we reduce them to, but are found and enveloped in the very person of Christ. Now, on a really practical level, and this is a this is important because this, this can easily and has been misapplied. Paul isn't saying that we can't identify as gay or straight, as Christian or Muslim, as black or white, male or female, trans or non-binary or cis or whatever. This is not Paul advocating for some like naive color blindness, not at all. What, what Paul is begging us to imagine and soak ourselves in within the waters of baptism is an approach, a way in the world where we don't privilege one identity over the other. But all that we bring, all our intersectionality, all our uniqueness, all our being belongs and is accepted and is sacred in Christ. Mutuality. So in Christ, all of our differences, all of our uniquenesses belong. They don't go away. They, they belong. They, it doesn't matter what color your bank card is in the new creation. Everyone belongs here. This is, this is the radical move of baptism. I'm a big fan of adult baptism. Like, like, friend, if you haven't been baptized, I, I think one of the most profound Christian statements that can be made is, is a social statement made in the waters of baptism by a professing adult. In, in Romans chapter 6, Paul writes, writes this to the church of Rome. He says, Or don't you know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Baptism. It's, it's, it's our statement to the community and the world that the, the way of priority and privilege have been crucified and buried with Christ. The, that's no longer our story. They, th 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 that's no longer our lens for the world. But, but we've risen to a new life, a new creation, defined in accepting the embrace of Christ for all. I'm also a big fan of any parent who wants to baptize their child. I, I can imagine few commitments more significant and essential for our world than than families committing before the community of faith to raise their child, forming them for a world not marked by social status or popularity contests, but by the relentless love of God for all people. What would it look like for a generation of parents and children to care less about their own prestige and popularity and more about being the environment where every kid knows they belong. Yeah. That's, that's baptism. 
So this morning, we celebrate Pride Sunday. And it's not by accident we're talking about baptism on Pride Sunday. Because whether you're gay, straight, or lesbian, single or partnered, two-spirited or questioning, whether you're closeted or out, transgender or cisgender, bisexual, pansexual, or asexual, whether you're non-binary or polyamorous, you are welcome here. You belong here. We bless you here. We are Humber Valley United Church. And that's why we will continue to keep saying that whomever you are, wherever you're from, whatever you've done or perhaps left undone, whomever you love, because we are people of baptism, you are welcome. And this is the gospel of Jesus Christ.